Good morning, everyone. Yes. All righty. So uh, I'm Father Philip Webster. I'm the Aviation Combat Element Chaplain. I'm your chaps, and uh, it's a really a, an honor for me to be with you all this morning. Uh, this training, uh, the Springs of Wellness, is a training unlike any other that you've ever had. And part of what makes it different is that you are the primary trainer. That's right. You are the primary trainer. My role is simply to facilitate this training for you. During the course of it, we're going to uh, demonstrate a model of resilience. So we're going to be talking a lot about health and resilience. So part of it is we're going to give you a model of resilience. Another thing that we're going to do, though, is we're going to lead you through some guided reflection so that you can determine your level of resilience. And finally, we're going to give you some resources so that once you've really engaged this topic, then you know what to do next. All right? So a couple of things I need from you. Because you are the primary trainer, I need you to stay engaged and motivated. All right? This is about your life. And no one knows your life better than you do. So please, respond when I ask you to respond. There are going to be some questions that I ask that are personal in nature. And I'm going to highlight those for you. You don't have to share that answer with anyone else. That's private between you, okay? The last thing is I'm going to try to stay super motivated, all right? Because we want to make sure this is an exciting training, something that stays engaging. Good to go? Yeah, right. All right. This training is going to be about 30 minutes in length. If Chaps doesn't finish it in 30 minutes, well, guess what? I'll give you a push-up for every minute I go over. Does that seem fair? Yeah. Yes. All righty. Okay, so since I mentioned health, I wonder if somebody can tell me what we mean by health. What is health? What does it mean to be healthy? Taking care of yourself. Taking care of yourself. That's a good answer. What else? Mind, body, and spirit. Make sure it's good to go. I like that answer. That's a pretty good answer there, partner. You know what? Um, the way I like to think of health is it's, it's our vitality. It's our capacity to flourish. And so sometimes when we talk about health, we think in terms of what's negative. We're not sick. We're not tired. But what are the things that actually contribute to health? What are the things that actually contribute to our vitality? And so we're going to be focusing on those elements. Another word that's really important is resilience. We hear resilience all the time. We want to be resilient. But what does it mean? And so I ask you, what does it mean to be resilient? Anybody have a, a suggestion? Yes. Uh, I once just thought that there's this mental callus that develops, and we, we are able to add on layer after layer with each experience and allows us to push through um, and get through what some people seem like, wow, I can't believe you did that, but it's just a mental callus. All right, so a mental callus that develops layer on layer that allows us to push through. I think there's something really good in that. I like this image of its developing and that it grows and we build one layer upon another. So that's a pretty good answer. Any other ideas on what we mean by resilience? So I think resilience has to do with our ability to engage, overcome, and bounce back from obstacles. Our ability to see the obstacle and engage it. Our ability to overcome the obstacle. And finally, our ability to bounce back after the fact. All right? And I think that that really ties into what both of you said as well. Um, so in order to really get a better sense of resilience, I want to use an example. How many of you have ever run an obstacle course? All right. Do you think you need to be physically healthy in order to run an obstacle course? How about emotional strength? Do you think you need emotional strength in order to run an obstacle course? All right. So it could be that if you're not emotionally strong, you'll give up on yourself. Have any of you ever run an obstacle course and felt afraid? I know I have. Okay. Fear is
is an emotion. And sometimes fear can get the best of us. And so we have to be able to manage our emotions if we're going to run that obstacle course. How about relational strength? Do you need to have strong relationships in order to run an obstacle course? Okay, I heard possibly. Why? Okay, all right. Are there moments when you might actually need that relationship? Okay. I don't know about you, but the obstacle courses I've run, it's not normally me by myself. There's normally a group of us running through an obstacle course together. There are sometimes obstacles where we have to figure out how we're going to work together as a team to get up and over the wall, where we're going to work together in order to navigate one obstacle onto the next. And so strong relationships are an important part of our ability to run an obstacle course. And then finally, why do we need spiritual strength to run an obstacle course? Our spirituality gets to the core of motivation about why we're there in the first place, why we would decide to take on that challenge, all right? And so when we think about health and resiliency, we need to be thinking about five aspects of health. We need to think about our physical, our mental, our emotional, our relational, and our spiritual, okay? We're going to spend the entire training focused in on those five elements, all right? And so, science as well as spirituality agree that everything in holistic health starts with the body. Everything we experience starts with our body. And that's because we are corporeal beings. We are tied to our bodies, all right? And so we're going to focus in on diet, rest, and exercise when we think about physical health. Now then, why do you think diet is important for physical health? That's right, if you don't eat good food, you are not going to be in a good shape. Our bodies are an incredible engine, and you have to fuel that engine. Have any of you ever heard the phrase, you are what you eat? Absolutely. So our bodies need a variety of nutrients and minerals. We need proteins and carbohydrates. We need a balanced diet in order to fuel our body. But here's the other thing I notice. If we don't eat well, it actually impacts other aspects of health. If we eat poorly, it'll impact our sleep. It'll impact our mood. And so our diet plays an incredibly important role in our sense of well-being. How about rest? Do we need rest in order to have physical health? Why? Why do we need rest? Absolutely. I know that there are some people here who work out regularly. All right, there are some really strong people here. My guess is that when you work out, you take time to allow your body and your muscles to recuperate. And in that process of resting, you grow back stronger. Rest is essential for our muscles. But have you ever considered that rest is essential for our minds? Our mental functioning requires rest. Have you considered that perhaps rest is essential for our spiritual health as well? Absolutely. Rest is such an important issue that the U.S. Navy surface fleet changed its entire way of doing operation in order to make sure that sailors got six to eight hours of sleep each and every day. They changed the entire way the surface fleet functions. I say that to you because the U.S. government recognizes that rest is critical for your health, and so should we. And finally, exercise. Is exercise an important part of physical health? Yes. yes, absolutely. We need to have strong muscles. We need to have flexibility. If we're going to run the obstacle courses, if we're going to be able to do our jobs, and so having regular exercise is an important part of physical health. Agreed? Yes. All right, fantastic. All right, so here we go. I'm going to give you some questions that are meant for your private reflection. I don't want any answers to these questions. In fact, what I want you to do with these questions is I want you to pay attention to how they make you feel. Yes, I said it. Pay attention to how they make you feel. If one or more of these questions makes you uncomfortable, if one or more of these questions is challenging for you, make a mental note of that. And we'll come back to that at the end of this training, okay? And so, do you eat the rainbow? 
Do you each and every day eat a variety of fruits and vegetables and proteins so that you are getting the nutrients you need? Are you getting six to eight hours of quality sleep each and every day? Do you have a weekly Sabbath? Do you have a time each and every week when you don't have to be productive, when you're not running, running, running? And lastly, have you made moderate exercise a regular part of your life? Again, those are private questions for your personal reflection. The second aspect is our mental health. The brain plays a key role in how we think and how we behave. And so we're going to be looking at three aspects of mental health. Neurology, uh, our cognition, and finally behavior. Now, disclaimer, I am not a neurologist, all right? But I read extensively on this because it has a tremendous impact on our mental functioning. Did anybody play football? Any, any football players? All right. Anybody uh, do extreme sports? Yeah? Okay. Anybody ever drive a car? Has anybody ever been in an accident? Okay. Now you might be thinking, Chaps, why are we talking about that? What we know is that things that cause impact to our bodies can also have an impact on our neurological functioning. You may have heard of traumatic brain injury. And before we came out here, we actually took some tests on that. Traumatic brain injury is important for us to think about because it affects the way the mind works and in turn affects the way we behave. You may know that there's been a lot writ written uh, on NFL players and on boxers who experience regular concussive effects and the impact it has on the way their relationships work. What we know is this, that impact to the brain affects emotional regulation and that can have a really harmful effect on individuals. And so, if you've ever had a situation where you've lost consciousness or become disoriented, you're going to want to be, be mindful of that. It could have an impact on how you treat others. It could have an impact on how you see yourself. So cognitive. What do I mean by cognition? Well, it's our thought processes, okay? Do you ever experience moments where you seemingly have negative thought after negative thought after negative thought? Do you ever experience those moments when you have positive thought after positive thought after positive thought? And what I'm getting to with this aspect of cognition is this. How we think actually affects the wiring of the brain. We know that the brain has what's called plasticity. It's constantly developing, it's creating new neural pathways. And so the way we choose to think, if we choose to look at things positively, guess what? Our brain begins to see things positively. If we choose to look at things negatively, then we start to see things negatively. That cognition affects our mood, and our mood affects our temperament. And the point I want you to be mindful of here is this. Those little choices about whether to look at something positively or negatively have long-term effects on how you experience the world. Does that make sense? Each and every thought has a long-term impact. And you get to choose it. So choose wisely. And the last thing is behavioral. What do you think I mean by behavioral? Any ideas? What's that? How you act. Exactly. So your actions. So what might be some actions that impact our mental health? Yes, sir. Drinking. 
Drinking, okay, so excessive alcohol use absolutely is a behavior that can impact our mental health. What might be some other examples of behaviors that impact our mental health? When you're tired, when you're tired, you get grumpy, right? And sometimes you need a nap. But there are things from a behavioral standpoint that make us more tired. And so this is a real life example uh, that I experience regular as a chaplain. Uh, a marine or a sailor will come in and they sit down and they'll say, chaps, I I'm mad. Well, you're mad about what? Well, I I just, I'm, I'm just not getting enough sleep. Well, why is that? And, and I start asking them questions and uh, I look over and they're holding an energy drink. And I say, well, how many energy drinks have you had? Twelve. <laughs> well, no wonder you're having trouble sleeping. And no wonder you're tired. So there are behaviors that we engage with that impact our mental functioning. And so it's important for us to think very carefully about the behavior that we engage in. Does that make sense? Okay. Again, little choices that have big consequences. So, here are some more reflection questions. Again, not meant for you to answer out loud. Have you ever experienced a loss of consciousness? A sense that you've just been disoriented. Have you recurring thoughts of sadness, fear, or hopelessness? Do you have a plan for self-coaching in moments that are challenging? And lastly, are there habits that help or hinder good mental function? So those are four questions for you personally to think about. All right, emotional health. Emotions influence our sense of self, our decision making, and our relationships. And we're going to focus in on experiences, awareness, and regulation. Now, a lot of people think the definition of human being is that we are thinking creatures. But I will tell you more and more, science is teaching us that we are primarily feeling creatures that sometimes think. Emotions impact us in our awareness and unconsciously in deep and powerful ways. And so it's important for us to be mindful of our emotional experiences. With that said, I have to mention something that might make you very upset. Okay? Some of us grew up in homes where there was somebody to encourage us. When we experienced a challenge, they'd say, you know what? You'll do better next time. When we fail, they'd say, it's all right. When uh, we succeed, they're there to give us the high five or a hug. They're there to say, I love you and I believe in you. For some of us, we didn't grow up in that home. We didn't grow up in an environment that was supportive. Maybe we were told that we weren't wanted. Maybe we were told that we would never account to anything. Maybe we were just treated as if we weren't there. All of those experiences shape the way we understand emotion. Now, it doesn't mean that we have to live in that forever, but it's important for us to take stock of the emotional context in which we were raised because it does shape the way we see the world and the way we feel the world. Does that make sense? Okay. Awareness. Emotional awareness is really important, and I need your help to demonstrate this, okay? So I'm going to give you a super quick quiz. In 30 seconds, I want you to name as many emotions as possible. Go. Happy, angry. Happy, angry. Sad. 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 Jealousy. 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 Excited. Excited. Scared. Nervous. Nervous. Anxious. Anxious. Joy. Joy. Happy. Stressed. Stressed. Depressed. Distraught. Distraught. Huh? Agony, all right. Confused. Grief. Okay, that's 30 seconds. You all got 15 emotions. I want you all to know that's a really good score. I do this test regularly with groups, and normally I get six to eight emotions. So you guys did better than average, right? Yeah. All right. 
Now, why do you think that was such an important little test? Why did I ask you to name emotions? So we can be aware of other people's emotions. That's right. That's good. There's a more basic reason. Yes, sir? Maybe because that's what some people feel like right now. Maybe some people are feeling that right now. Absolutely. I would offer it's important to be aware of emotions because we have to be aware of our own emotions. When we're aware of how we're feeling, that's the first step to gaining mastery over how we're feeling. So maybe we're feeling irritated. Well, why are we feeling irritated? Because I'm frustrated. Well, why am I frustrated? Because I didn't get the promotion I wanted. Why is that? And then you can begin working through how you feel. And then you can make better choices about how you behave. So emotional awareness is critical. And that leads us finally to this aspect of emotional regulation. What do you do when you feel emotions powerfully? Do you suppress them? Do you act them out and punch holes in walls? What do you do? I think it's really important for us to have a plan ahead of time for how we're going to manage emotions. I will confess to you, there are some situations that I know put me in a bad emotional situation. And so, I've worked out self-coaching techniques so that when I'm in that moment, I can just focus in and do my very best in that situation. I would encourage you, have emotional awareness, identify those situations that are challenging, and put in place a plan for dealing with them. Does that make sense? All right. And so here are some more reflection questions. Have you experienced emotion in your important relationships? How have you experienced it? Can you name a number of feelings and distinguish between them? So do you know the difference between contempt and anger and revulsion, excitement, anticipation, and fulfillment? Are there predictable circumstances that cause you to feel strong emotions? And finally, when feelings build up and up and up, well, what do you do? How do you manage those emotions? And so, move on to relational health. Our connections with others shape our past, our present, and our future. And earlier I mentioned uh, our families of origin. Our families of origin have a tremendous impact on how we see the world and how we understand connections with one another. Can we trust another person? Is it safe to say, here is what's bothering me, or here's what I want? Our relational dynamics are critical. Now, you might be thinking, chaps, come on, relationships aren't that important. So I want to talk to you about a movie. And I think this movie demonstrates the importance of relationship profoundly. Some years ago, Tom Hanks starred in a movie called Castaway. All right? You ever seen it? Yeah, all right. And so that movie describes how a person gets stranded on an island. And over time, his desire for connection is found in a volleyball named Wilson. And he takes Wilson and he paints a little face on Wilson, and everywhere he goes around the island, he's got Wilson with him. And he gets to the stage where he decides he has to leave the island. And so he gets on a raft, and he's out in the middle of the ocean. And a wave comes along, and Wilson gets knocked off the raft. So he jumps off the raft, and he starts swimming toward Wilson, but he sees his raft going one way, but Wilson is going another and he has to make a choice, and so he goes back to the raft, and he looks back, and he sees Wilson drifting away. And he's, Wilson! Now, that is an example of how the need for connection is part of who we are as human beings. And so, if you can be attached to a volleyball, imagine the importance of the attachments we have to one another. 
That may be found in your family, but it can also be in your friends. In fact, I would offer that for some of us, our friendships are more important than our family relationships. I know that in my life, my best friend, he's closer to me than my brothers. And so friendships are absolutely an important part. They impact how we see the world. They impact our behavior. They impact our sense of well-being. And lastly, the workplace. I dare say that you all spend more time at work and with the people in your work centers than you do your families. Yep, I see a lot of nods out there. And so that should lead an important question. What's the quality of our workplace relationships? In our relationships at work, are we supportive of one another? Do we take the time to listen? Can we respectfully disagree with one another? Or are those relationships marked by knife hands and by uh, rude comments and a lack of forgiveness and a lack of understanding? The quality of our workplace relationships bears a direct impact on our sense of well-being as well. And so I will tell you as a chaplain, I look at my counseling trends and I can tell you where there are solid workplaces and where there are workplaces where people are not supportive. It bears out in behavior. And so it's really important for us to think about the quality of relationships we have in our workplace. And so here are some more questions for your personal reflection. Do you have three people in your life with whom you could share a deep loss or a disappointment? Are there three people you know you could turn to when the feces hits the rotary oscillator? How have you experienced forgiveness in your life? And how do you share the gift of forgiveness with others? To put it another way, from my tra tradition, we say, blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. What does it mean to be a good friend? We talked about the value of friendship. But what does it mean to be a good friend? And finally, who are the people in your life who make you feel good about being you? So we'll move on to the last area in spirituality. Spirituality explores meaning and purpose across time and cultures. Now, I want you to know straight up, I'm not here talking to you about religion because spirituality and religion are two different things. Spirituality is that deep river of life that flows through the human heart, through every human heart, through every culture. Religion is the organized reflection on that river. It's how different people understand spirituality and do it in a group, okay? So we're talking about spirituality, not necessarily about religion today. And three aspects of spirituality are important. Community, sense of purpose, and our practices. So what's a community? That's really good. So we're talking a group of people that come together. Uh, they're working together for goals. Uh, there's a set of rules like customs and courtesies. You know, a community that immediately comes to mind for me is the Marine Corps. In fact, many Marines tell me they joined the Corps because they wanted to belong to something bigger than themselves. The Marine Corps is a community. There's ways of functioning. There's a culture. Yeah, so that's an example. For some of us, uh, maybe it's our favorite football team. You know me? I'm an Ohio State fan, all right? Go Buckeyes. Uh, maybe for some of you, it is a faith community. Maybe a church, a synagogue, a mosque. Uh, maybe it's your neighborhood, where you're from, you know? A, a lot of us take pride in the, the, the city or the, the state we're from. Those are communities, and those communities shape the way we see the world. But they also provide incredible strength to us. We can sometimes lean back on our community. That community can give us strength and courage, and they can give us energy in moments of challenge. Sense of purpose. What do I mean by sense of purpose? Well, I like the phrase, what's your why? Why? Why are you here? 
Why do you choose to do the things you do? Why do you have hope for the future? Your sense of purpose in life. And again, for some of us, that comes from our religious tradition. But I think it absolutely can come from our community as well. It's an important question for us to think about. I know what my why is. What's your sense of purpose? Why are you here? And lastly, our practices, spiritual practices. Now, I know there are some people in here who are incredibly physically fit. And so if I were to ask you, how do I get better at the run for the PFT, you'd be able to tell me what steps I need to take in order to get better at the run. If I wanted to get better doing my pull-ups, you'd be able to tell me, here are things you need to do in order to get better at it, right? You could tell me. So, if you want to get stronger in your spirituality, what are things that we can do? What are practices we can do to develop stronger spiritual, spirituality? I'm going to give you two examples. There are thousands, but I'm just going to give you two. The first is meditation. Anybody ever meditate? I do. Meditation is a spiritual practice. It's found in Eastern traditions as well as Western traditions. It's something that medical science acknowledges as well as religious communities. And in meditation, we allow ourselves to become more attuned to where we're, what we're thinking and feeling. We become more attuned to our body and the rhythms of our body. And in so doing, it actually affects our capacity to bounce back from stress. It's scientifically established. Meditation is a spiritual practice that actually reinforces the rest of our health. Here's another spiritual practice. Compassion. Acts of charity and kindness. Have any of you ever volunteered for a charitable organization? Maybe visited somebody who's sick, helped to build a house for Habitat for Humanity. All of those are important ways that we can practice compassion. And here's the amazing thing about the spiritual practice of compassion. When we spend time focusing on the needs of others, guess what we're not doing? Focusing we're not focusing on ourselves. We're not feeling sorry for ourselves. We're not thinking about what we're entitled to. In those moments when we focus on another, we actually are the ones being blessed. It's amazing. Bless others and be blessed in the process. So those are just two practices that we can do to become more spiritually fit. And so here are some additional questions for private reflection. Where do you find answers to the big why questions of life? Where do you go to find out what's your why? If you're not sure about that, please come see me. Another question, what spiritual or religious practices bring you direction, comfort, and hope? And those three words are intentional. Direction, a sense of your compass in life. Comfort, where do you go in times of deep sorrow? And hope, hope's essential for life. Hope's essential for that sense that something better is there to come. Do you have other people at work or at home that support your spiritual life direction? Here's an example of what I mean. I chose to become part of this community. And so I make sure that my hair meets regs. Now, if one day I decide that I'm not going to get a haircut for the next month and a half, I'm pretty sure Gunny over there is going to remind me of my direction within this community, right? Do you have people in your life who can support your direction in life, who can keep you on the path that you've chosen? And finally, how do you make ethical and moral choices? Now, I'm not telling you how to make those choices, but what I am saying is have you thought in advance about how you're going to make choices between right and wrong, about how you're going to make the right choice in that tough moment. What we've done today is a self-assessment. 
And along the way, if you have heard questions that make you think, hmm, I'm really uncomfortable with the answer to that question, I invite you to go to this website. This website is private. You don't have to put in any of your PII. It is something that works on our government computers. It actually uh, is funded through a government grant. And on this website, you have the opportunity to answer questions privately. And based on your answers, it'll tell you, well, maybe you should consider this. Or maybe you need to go and speak to a mental health professional. Or maybe you might be struggling with grief, so you should probably talk to a chaplain. This is an incredible resource. What I like about it is it has questions for individuals, but it also has questions for people who have a military lifestyle. Or if your families are in the military, this is a great place to go. I believe that it's really important to save the most important thing for last. And so I'm going to end with these two pieces of advice, pieces of encouragement. What we know uh, when it comes to destructive behavior is that individuals who have a strong sense of community and individuals who have a strong sense of purpose have health and resilience. Those are important parts of being a healthy, resilient person. And so if you're struggling with your sense of purpose or if you feel isolated and not connected, please reach out. Please let me know. Please let medical know. Please go to this website. There's people who care about you and want to support you. The last slide are the uh, references and resources. I'll make this entire presentation available to you. And if you would like any further information, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you so much for being uh, very engaged. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you.